that's how we're doing that moving forward. I had a patient yesterday from anxiety about the radiation. Oh, yeah? He had a, like another one like two weeks prior, and he was like, how much am I absorbing? Still freaking out. <laughs> he was like freaking out the whole time. Was he, was he tan? Like, I had to take two. Um, open your combination. Don't be afraid of the radiation. It gets on my nerves. I said, I'm going to say that. Did you ask him, like, have you ever tanned or anything like that? All right. They get more sun. So, general body position, guys, as I just said, I have it in red for you right there. We can do upright or recumbent, but my best suggestion for you is stick to the upright whenever possible because, as I keep saying, you're eliminating the sciences at the same time that you're doing the other head work thus saving the patient from extra radiation and saving you from doing extra work as well. You have a question, Jen? Yeah, do we have any Im or any images of um, non-cocephalic or brachycephalic like x-rays? Because I, I don't think I do on here, but I could find some if you're really curious. I just looked up to Google of uh, uh, non-cocephalic. It looks like a freaking alien. Does it? Like, like you have to show me. The movie. You have to show me later. <laughs> All right, so body position, guys, of course, that is going to shift slightly when we're talking about head work. Well, why? Because we're doing head, but we're talking about hyposthenic, asthenic, hypersthenic, and all that good stuff. Why would that affect the head work positioning, you think, in particular? Mm -hmm. Can you say your question one more time, please? So why would things like our body habitus affect head work? Because they can't get closer to the eye. That's way more than That's a deformity on that image. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, why would body habitus affect head work positioning? Because they have exposure factors. Exposure factors. Maybe? Yeah. So I'm hearing some of the right answers there, but mainly because as you've seen in lab, when we do yeah. head work, especially like a lateral, we don't fit the body lateral, do we? We oblique the body and put the face and head lateral. Thus, different body habitus is going to have to oblique that body differently to accommodate putting that head in the correct true lateral, which can be tough, as y'all have seen, amongst different variances of our body shapes, when you're lining up that pencil, trying to get that IPL nice and straight. Are we nailing that, by the way? Or is that driving y'all nuts? IPL? With the pencils, find that IPL with the pencils and the The pens. thing is, for me, it's flat, but for Mr. Fun, he's like, no, you gotta come down just a little bit. It's, it's a little annoying, but. It can be annoying, it really can. Maybe your IPL is a little off, too. <laughs> oh. I know mine is, my eyes are a little bit lower than the other, so it's like, Unlevel eyes. Yeah. So this is showing you what I'm talking about here, guys. Some of the adjustments you might need to consider. And really, this is with your extremes, like your very skinny versus very large patients. So your hyposthenic, asthenic patients are usually need support at the chest to elevate that C-spine a little bit more. Otherwise, you end up with a tilt like you see right here on the left. You, of course, want that nice straight face, that good horizontal IPL. Hypersthenic, they're going to also probably require some realistic support at the head. So once again, prevent that tilt. We want that head to be nice and straight, for those pupils to be level. And this is also why I prefer doing standing because it's showing you it done on a table. And at least for me, when I'm trying to check those lines, oh, it throws me off trying to do it sideways like that. I feel like they're looking straight at me at the same level. It's gonna be easier to level the IPL, so to speak. Yes. Isn't it also hard, also hard to keep your head up when you're laying flat? Oh, it's, yeah. I mean. Obviously, you have to have your head elevated to see right there. Yeah. If you're feeling bad or you got pain, your head feels heavy. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. Okay, like I was saying, guys, cleanliness. Hair and skin the face are, yes, very naturally oily, so make sure you use your shampoo and conditioner and wash your face because that oil is going to be all over your IR. But illness, and most of our patients in the hospital clinic are ill or not feeling good. That's going to increase the oil, the oiliness, which can make it hard for them to put their face firmly on an IR because it'll actually slide around, believe it or not, like I was saying. But they don't make your IR all gunky and gross too, and you don't want that. Uh, cranial procedures, usually you have to have direct contact with the patient's face. Don't be afraid to touch the patient's face, by the way. I know we don't like touching faces because, let's be honest, a lot of faces are gross. But put gloves on, you need to touch the face to get that head level. Don't rely on the patient to tilt it and turn it the right way because they're not going to. You gotta take control get that face exactly where you need to be. Of course, ask them before touching their face. Don't just start moving their head around without saying anything. Don't think you've lost your mind. 
may I please maneuver your head for the x-ray, may I please touch your face to get you in the correct position. That way they know what you're doing. Do clean after every patient, guys, or you're gonna have nice face oil all over your IR. And I know we don't want that, it's kind of nasty. And do wash your hands, even if you're wearing gloves. You should be wearing gloves anyway, but we should be doing that with every exam regardless. By the way, Hesse question that they have next week. What's the minimum number of seconds you should wash your hands between patients? Two happy birthdays. 20 seconds. Two happy birthdays? 20 seconds, correct. They're not gonna have two happy birthdays on the <laughs> chest, by the way, but that should equal to 20 seconds. All right, close collimation, guys. Always gonna be a factor on your radiation protection as well as enhancing your image, making it have higher spatial resolution, adequate contrast resolution, and giving you that optimized image. If we're doing a facial bones x-ray, we do not need to include the entire skull. <coughs> Harris Health employees, which do not do this, and drive me nuts. <laughs> if we're doing facial bones, collimate down to the facial bones. It's gonna make it look better, and you're protecting the patient because it's a very thick area of penetration. You're frying the patient's eyes, which can develop cataracts in the future. No, 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 we gotta open it up. Don't open it up, that makes you so mad. So make sure you shield them accordingly as well. Um, go ahead, shielding still per state regulations. That has not changed as of yet. And I know I keep saying that it may be going away in the next few years, but as for me, I'm gonna continue shielding my patients because I'm not taking that kind of risk, personally. Yes? Do you have to leave it over the gonads if you're not gonna be in that area? You should, because it's scattered. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, could you bring it higher? You could. You can get on the whole vest if you want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to make that choice. But the okay. most radius sensitive, of course, is gonna be the gonads, the female's breast tissue, so it might be good to the best, though. use the vest. But that's totally up to you as a tech, how you wanna do that. All right, artifacts. We always talk about artifacts. Well, I'm sure we know there's a lot of artifacts to be found in the head and the face. Mm -hmm. Things like, of course, eyeglasses. You gotta take Granny's eyeglasses off. She might say, "Well, honey, I can't see." Well, don't worry, Grandma. I'm gonna help you see. I'm gonna guide you to that eye. You trusted me. Um, dentures and partial plates. That's a big one there as well. Ask your patients if they have false teeth or partial plates because those will obscure quite a bit of anatomy in the face. They are not radiolucent. They show up as big white blobs on the X-ray. Hearing aids. Hearing aids. If you have an elderly patient, I mean, don't be looking in their ear, but usually you can notice if they have a hearing aid. A lot of them are a little harder to see these days, but ask them if they have a hearing aid or anything in their face, ear area, anything that's gonna obscure the x-ray. Jewelry, earrings, and that's gonna be your big enemy right there, especially if you work pediatrics like I did. But I just got it pierced two days ago. I can't remove the stud, da 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 da, -da. Well, you're still gonna recommend that they remove that, otherwise it's gonna obscure something that radiologist needs to see. If they still refuse to remove it, what do we do at that point? Document. We document accordingly that we attempted twice to have them remove the jewelry, they should refuse to do so. That way it doesn't fall back on you because from personal experience, what happens when you don't document it? Well, you get a nice phone call from the doctor saying, why in the world did you not remove the earrings? What are you doing? Where'd you go to school? Do you even know how to x-ray? Yeah, they get that mean sometimes. But you gotta document accordingly because if you do, you're not gonna question that because you, you at least attempted it and you have it written down that you did so. Wigs and hair pieces, That's big, big one there. Even um, ponytails, guys. Ponytails will show up on the x-ray because some women have very thick hair. The hair shows up very distinctly on an x-ray. Um, like cornrows, things like that, braids. And some people are like, well, I just had my braids done. I don't wanna take them out. Well, you ask them very nicely again if they can. They still refuse. We document it accordingly because some people are just not gonna do you really think I'm gonna take my braids off? Like, no. Well, I know you're not, but I'm still gonna. <laughs> but listen, listen. I know you're not, but I'm still gonna <laughs> ask you so I can document that you said no. Oh, okay. But Otherwise, I get a nice phone serious? call from the doctor. Yeah. You could yeah. also like yeah. put it away from the image. That's what I was gonna say as well. With hair, if their hair is maneuverable, now don't be go playing with people's hair. By the way, don't just be moving people's hair. Ask, yeah, say, like, ask, may I move your hair to the side, or will you pull, pull your hair to the side for me and hold it to the side? Things like long hair, ponytails, things like that. Trying to see who has long hair. Like, like Monster, you have longer hair. I would ask you to pull that hair to the side before you take an X-ray. That way, it doesn't obscure what we're trying to see. Adjust the clips so that's mm -hmm. like pop. I had a no, you were just help remove the clips. You no, want to remove the clips. Like, like if you're doing a C spine or something like that, and the hair is in the way mm -hmm. that they have like a scrunchie, mm -hmm. like this woman came in and I saw the scrunchie. Asked Correct. Her if she could move her hair to just be like a ball, and she said, Oh, honey, no, this is a wig. I was like, Oh, <laughs> oh 
could you remove it? And as comfortable as that is, you need to have them remove the wigs, guys. Those wigs are going to show up all kinds of artifacts. She looked at me so crazy. Guys, having a house full of girls with long, beautiful hair, hairpins, man. Hairpins are going to be your biggest enemy. Those hairpins are everywhere. My girl, I, I step on hairpins all day, the morning and night. There's hairpins all over my house. Hairpins, you make sure they take those out. Uh, barrettes and ponytail holders, scrunchies, whatever they're using, make sure that's removed. And yes, prosthetic eyes. Yeah. Prosthetic eyes are also going to be a massive artifact. If they do have one, which is rare, of course, they need to remove that. Otherwise, it's going to obscure that optical area that we want to visualize on the x-ray. Yes. And these are all like metal or just like, oh, slightly denser. So, like, it depends on what it's made of. So, what are those curlers? Like the old school curlers that they're like thin plastic. <laughs> the curlers. They need to remove the curlers. Okay. I have had that happen before, believe it or not. Yes, a curler with the uh, little do rag on top of it. Yeah. You know, we used to call them do rags. They still call them do rags? They still do it. It used to be popular around scale. Remember when the do rags? Oh, well, if they had curlers, they might have, yeah, they might have been harder. All right. So a couple of review questions before we start getting into positioning. We should know this right here. Radiographic baseline used for positioning of the cranium that connects the outer corner of the eye to the EAM. What is that? That wasn't a trick question. That was the orbito line. That's a different way of asking that same question, by the way. Now, a lot of you said the can outer canto meatal because what did it say? The outer corner of the eye, which is the outer canthus. Mm -hmm. but that actually lines up, if you remember, with that OML. We're not going to be making up new lines. We're going to be using the same ones we've been reviewing here, guys. Keep that in mind. But we can ask them in different ways based on anatomy that we've all learned with the last section. And canto meatal is, isn't really... That's not real. No. How about this one right here? Connecting the acanthion to the EAM. That should be obvious, yes. Letter C, acanthio, yale line. So keep that in mind, guys, because here on out, we're going to be talking about these positioning lines with each position, because as you guys know in lab, all the positioning relies heavily upon making sure the correct line is perpendicular to the IR. Can you give us a, like, a sample yeah, question, like, like right now, so that wasn't that simple, you know, like, um, I'll think of one later, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, we'll, we'll come back to that, all right, essential projections of the skull, guys, as you can see, there are quite a few positions that we go over, this is more than you're doing in lab, we have a few variances that we're going to hit, depending on whether the patient can stand or not, whether they can be PA versus AP, things like that, of the ones we're going to hit, we're going to go over the lateral, we have two ways to do a lateral, that being the upright, which would be our regular right and left laterals. Or if they're in a trauma situation, it would be a cross table lateral, which we're gonna label as a dorsal decubitus. That should bring us back to semester one. What does dorsal decubitus mean? We're laying on our back, horizontal beam. Same concept as with the abdomen and chest. We have a regular PA, but we also have a PA axial Caldwell. Now, we're going to learn both, but of the two, you're always just going to do a Caldwell. That's a superior view. Keep that in mind, even though we, look, we learn both. The Caldwell, not only what you do in lab, but what we always do, period, is the superior, superior view to let us see those petrous ridges through the orbits. AP, we have a regular one, and then we have an AP axial, and an AP axial town method. We're going to go over all those, but what's the gold star one? Just the towns. Just tell these are variances, keep that in mind. And then of course we have the sub mento vertical or the SMV, the most comfortable one of all, yes. Y'all love pulling that neck back, huh? So comfortable for that cranial base. Yeah, one of those uncomfortable positions, of course, that we have to perform on some of our patients. So that's our essential projections of the skull. And as we go through, I'll make sure I reiterate once again which are the main ones you need to know, which ones are those variances we're talking about. All right, or made you pass out this morning? Okay, so our lateral projection. 
So here's where it can get a little confusing. Remember I was telling you guys when we do a lateral, although we put the head lateral, the body's actually more so in an oblique position. So when we say what is the patient position for a lateral skull x-ray, they are actually in an anterior oblique position, which would be our LEO or our REO. I'll say it again. Even though the head is placed lateral, the actual patient position is anterior oblique position. We have to oblique the body to put the head close enough to the IR in a true lateral position. So part is lateral, patient is oblique. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Also, they can be seated upright or recumbent. Of course, the superior would be upright as we've been discussing. For that part position, we're gonna put the MSP of the head parallel to the IR. We're gonna use that IPL, that being the line going through the pupils and make sure that is perpendicular to our IR. And our IOML will be parallel to the long axis of the IR. Make sure to remember are these first two points right here. When we talk about MSP, what are we talking about? Mid-sagittal plane, that goes straight through the body, front to back, yes? Mm -hmm. So if you know anything about parallel, it means two lines side by side. So you see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. IR's a line, MSP's a line, therefore, that's why it's parallel to the IR. Does that make sense? But we also have something that's perpendicular, that being the IPL, and that's when two lines cross, yes? Mm -hmm. So if we draw a line for the pupils, it's gonna hit the IR, making a T sign. That's why that is perpendicular to the IR. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? And it's all about those pupils, guys, and it's very important that you learn to manipulate that head correctly. And what I want you to keep practicing, especially in lab, is tell your patient to look you directly in the eyes, almost until it's like uncomfortable. You want them to look you directly in the eyes, don't be looking around because you have to follow the pupils to get them level in the correct way to ensure that IPL is perpendicular and that the head is not rotated or tilted. Because what gets us the most on these laterals? Rotation and tilt. I'm sure Mr. Fong, Ms. Boney have been driving y'all crazy with that. Oh, it's slightly tilted, it's slightly rotated. But you gotta get just right, because if you don't, a tiny little variance in that will throw the anatomy completely off of what we wanna see. The face is a bit unforgiving. The face and head, if you're not in that perfect position, the anatomy will not fall correctly. It's going to mess your whole image up. So it's essential to have that just right. Not because they're being mean, but it really is that essential. Mm -hmm. Give me that chin down a little bit. You want to be looking up at the ceiling. That's going to mess you up too. So once again, as you can imagine, it's just so much easier to do it standing or sitting versus on the table. At least for me, I feel like I'm having to do it sideways. I don't like doing it like this, and I feel like I make more mistakes with the rotation and tilt when they're on the table versus sitting up or standing up. This gives you a much easier time overall. You have to go like this to see the yeah, it's, straight and everything. Yeah. All right, for that central ray, of course it's perpendicular. We're not adding an angle to the laterals. Where does it enter? Be careful on these central ray points, especially on the laterals when we're talking about the difference between skull and facial bones, because there are variances, and sciences as well, by the way, there aren't variances to where it enters, even though they're kind of in the general same area. For the lateral skull, we are entering two inches superior to the EAM. So of course, that's the ear hole, to put it simply. Two inches above that is directly where we center for that lateral skull. Collimation, we're gonna use a 10 by 12 set, but we are going to collimate accordingly to include only the cranium. In other words, we want the top of the light to be grazing the top of the head, but we can afford to cut off the face below because we're not doing facial bones, we're doing skull, which counts as cranial bones. We want that cranial area only, not the entire head and face. That's not what we're after. So make sure you adjust that accordingly. Check for light at the vertex, anterior, posterior, and base of those skull, skull borders. So when you're collimating down vertically, just comment down until you see a tip of light, like a little bit of light just above the skull. And those with high hair, be careful. If someone has higher hair, you might have to press that hair down a little bit. Make sure you comment down accordingly, just to graze the top of that vertex. If you do so, you'll be cutting off enough of the face as well to have that proper collimation. Be careful on the horizontal, because what do we need to include? It says anterior, posterior, and base of skull borders. Well, what's that mean? We want to include frontal bone to occipital bone, front to back. So a little bit of light in the front, a little bit of light in the back, and then I'll have that entire cranial area included. Yes? Is, is the bread bar in the vertex the same spot 
It is not. What's a bregma? Vertex is right in the front and bregma is where the... That's a junction. So which, which, which will probably be behind the vertex? Bregma is a junction of sutures. Vertex is just the top of the skull. Central so top portion. It's not portion. the same spot though. No. no. They're close, but they're not the same spot. Uh, bregma is in that picture though. If you look at it, where the line and the coronal suture are, the blue line and the coronal suture, you can see the bregma as opposed to where the vertex would be. The vertex is closer to the top. The coronal, you know. Don't worry about bregma. We're not going to use that for positioning. Vertex we will use though. All right, so what are we seeing as far as structures go? Should look very familiar because we were just tested on this. So structures, of course, we want the superimposed halves of the cranium, and we do know it's in halves because of things like the parietal bone and the temporal bones coming in pairs. We want that nice, beautiful superimposition like you see right here. And that's why it's so important to get that IPL perpendicular because of a slight variance of the tilt or rotation, you'll start seeing that anatomy distort quite a bit. And all it takes is just a slight tilt or rotation, which is why we're so hard on that when it comes to positioning. What needs to be well demonstrated? Well, of course, that's the big one, that good old cella tersica. We have the anterior clinoid processes, the dorsum celli, and the posterior clinoid processes. So we're really wanting to demonstrate that sphenoid bone area very clearly. Why? The sphenoid bone is a very critical bone to break. Why? Because it's so close to the brain, and it's also where a lot of our CSF drains down through the sphenoid sinus throughout the rest of our body as it's eliminated. If there is an injury to the brain, it's often due to that sphenoid bone being fractured and either puncturing the brain or compromising that fluid drainage system that takes place in there. Thus, we want to be able to see that area very clearly. You know, we still want to see the rest too as well, but that's really the star of our show is that sphenoid area that we've been talking about for a lateral cranium x-ray. It's a very pretty skull x-ray. And you see how they're just grazing the top of that vertex? That's what you want to do. Graze in the back, graze in the front. I mean, I wish we could accommodate more of the face off here, but I don't know if it's the type of cassette they're using or what, but I feel like it's still too much of the face on there personally, but it's still a very pretty x-ray. And you said it was rotated a little bit? So I said this is not, this is not, this is almost perfectly lateral. Um, and question, so Ms. Shemeika? Uh, you said the sphenoid is the uh, star of the show on lateral? Or on this lateral cranium, yes. Okay. I mean, we're interested in the whole cranial area, but we're really focused on that sphenoid area. That's a very critical area to fracture. It's very dangerous if we fracture it. Yeah. So then the shadows that we see um, are just like one side being magnified over the other. That's why it looks a little bit. Shadows. Like, or not shadows, but structures. So you see the orbital, sorry, like, yeah. Uh, you see the orbital roof here, but like directly underneath it is the other one. The cribriform plate? Yeah. And then in front of where it says the cella tersica, there's like this line here and it doubles right there. That is, that's, just, that's insignificant. That's, that's actually normal. It's supposed to look like that. Really the biggest judge as far as rotation goes, to answer your question there, Jay, if you're really looking for rotation, look to the cella tersica. You don't have that very distinct saddle shape like you see right there. Mm -hmm. If it's kind of disappearing, that tells you maybe you have rotation or tilt. Um, the rest of these, you actually see variances in the way that anatomy lies in front of it. When you're talking about cribriform plates, um, ethmoid areas, things like that. But the real indicator is that cella tersica. If that's not demonstrated well, then you've got some clear rotation or tilt going on. You can look at the mandible as well, that kind of can indicate it for you too, because it doesn't look like superimposed. Okay, evaluation criteria, of course, we want the evidence of the proper collimation and the correct side marker. We want that entire cranium without rotation or tilt, very critical. So how do we check that? Superimposed orbital roofs, greater than the sphenoid, which you really can't see those very well enough to use that in my opinion, but that is one of the evaluation criteria. Superimposed mastoid regions and the EAM. Oh, I forgot, that is a really good one as well. If you have rotation or tilt, you'll see two EAMs, two holes. Mm -hmm. okay. If you see one, that's another indicator that you're perfectly lateral. That's a really good one. So Superimposed TMJs as well for the same concept. And of course, that's cella tersica in perfect profile like you see in that picture. Yes? EAMs right here? It's that little hole, yes. What's right next to it, immediately to the left? 
That's not an EIO if that's what you're wondering. That's just those air cells. Okay. That's part of the air cells. Yeah, cells. You'll see a very distinct round black hole side by side if there's a rotation going on there. I'll try to find an image to show you what I'm talking about on that. It's, it's actually a really good identifier as well. What else? No overlap of the C-spine by the mandible. We get that by tilting the chin upwards slightly or down, depending on how we have the positions. And of course, our bony detail and surrounding soft tissue, we achieve that by using the buffer techniques. That would be our lateral projection skull, or lateral cranium x-ray. So the main thing is, if, so the main thing on collimations, if you're centered correctly, as long as you collimate down enough to where you're just raising the top of the skull, that's where you want your, your optimal collimation to your show. And then front and back, you just want to make sure you raise the frontal bone to the back of the occipital bone. Okay. And then I noticed that you said that was too much facial. So like, I think you cut it off like. I mean, I ideally would, but I don't know what kind of cassette they were using here. I mean, usually, if you're doing this correctly, you're going to be cutting all this off, like, like all the mouth off, essentially, because the occipital bone goes down quite far. Okay, so you don't get those. I think I think what happened here is that you did this lengthwise. One thing I personally do, I don't know if they taught you this in labs, is I do these crosswise because mm -hmm. in a lateral, the skull is quite long, like quite broad. So I feel like it's safer to do the crosswise over the lengthwise, or you're going to cut the front and back off on that lengthwise cassette. I think they use lengthwise on this one. Would it give you better spatial resolution? Not necessarily. It's just going to be easier to include all the anatomy without cutting it off. Okay, I'm just showing you a few more examples right there, guys. Um, so let's look at that image on the top left. Is that a good skull image? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? No. Yes. 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 Per the situation, yes it is. Why? Because what are we looking at on that top left one? That's a trauma case. We're doing that horizontal cross table beam. You can see there's a bunch of equipment on the patient. That's acceptable. Not optimal by any means, but that's definitely acceptable for a trauma x-ray. Moving to the top right, what about that one right there? No, because you're cutting my stuff. You're cutting stuff off on this one? No. You sure? You said top right or top oh, bottom right? Top, top right. right, top right, I'm sorry. You got your anatomy. So top right, we've got everything on there, but if you look closely, we do have some rotation going on. Almost like you have like two cell you got two plates here. You can kind of see that the head's tilted on that if you look very closely. You can also even see the apple head. You can see how the C-spine's looking um, like it's tilted as well. The whole head looks like it's turned on its side. Bottom left. What about that one? Nope. Big no-no. We're cutting off the vertex. We're cutting off the back of the occipital bone. That was lengthwise. We've got like almost all the C-spine on there. I don't know what that person is doing. And we got little fractures on there as well. Yes, we cut off the fractures. Quick question. Is the top left, do they have a trach? They, or is that an NG tube? That's NG. That's, that's an NG? It looks like a trach. That's NG. That's NG. Trick's going to be a lot more distinct than that. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom right. How about that one? Yeah. That's a little cone here. No. A little cone There is motion on that. Y'all see the motion? You have to probably look on the TV screen to see that, but you see the blurriness of that image? That's an example of a baby flailing its head around. Now, while it's in a pretty good lateral, well, we got all the neck on there. Mm -hmm. We got all the face Shoulder on nice. there. We all we only need this part, right? We, we can cut all this off. Mm -hmm. Honestly, the main thing. Now we just need a swimmer's view. The main, yeah. The main thing is this thing is moving around. That's going to be one of your big challenges if you do pediatric skulls, which you'll do with every skeletal survey for abuse cases. You got to use those earmuffs I was showing y'all to hold their head still. Otherwise, it's going to be the result. I call them the big earmuffs. You put the little pads on the side of their head. For a lateral like this, what you would do is let me show you how you do this. You're going to take your earmuff, put it behind the head. You're going to take your finger and tilt the chin up, hold it like that, and the baby won't be able to move. Press against yourself, and the baby's still, and you get a nice true lateral. That's a little pediatric trick you can do there. Can you do it again? Yeah. Oh, it's kind of, well, earmuff over here, no, tilt the chin not. up. Don't do a like split. Don't do a split. Don't do a split. Yeah, I'm trying to yeah, not cover a picture. <laughs> like this. Split 
and you hold hold the chin and split my penis. Yeah. Or is that the Lord? So we're is, the, is, there, <laughs> is there fractures on their like or near their navel area? On this one? Uh -huh. Nope. That's just the sutures. It's not, not the sutures. It's just the um, not the font nails. Just the ossification coming together. The, the development, the cartilage. Wait. So that projects all the way into the orbits. It does. It does. So you're gonna see. I mean, I, I'll show you some more baby skulls if y'all are curious later. But the baby skulls are just like all coming apart at some points because it's all still ossifying. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really fascinating to look at. Yes. So with the babies, you still do them upright, or how? how so how is if that? you can, yes, but it's almost impossible. Uh -huh. so, so you're just gonna have them laying down. We'll do. And by the way, you're not gonna do PAs on babies because you can't put the baby face down. That'd be a big no-no. Mm -hmm. Suffocate them. You're going to hold on their back, and you're going to hold their head with the earmuffs and pull the chin up okay. to get your AP, called well, so to speak. And we're going to turn them on their side, earmuff behind the head, hold the chin, get that lateral, and anything else you need to do, you'll make okay. adjustments. Usually with babies, you're just going to do an AP and lateral, typically. You don't need all the fine extra positions. There's not much to see there. Okay. You know? We can't tape anything, right? Some people do, but you shouldn't. No. All right, PA and the PA axial caldwell, these are grouped together. Keep in mind we're gonna go over two distinct positions here. One does not have an angle, while the other one has the magic word axial, therefore there is an angle. Of the two, the one you're always gonna to opt to do, period, is that PA axial caldwell method. Why would you ever do the PA? Honestly, I have no idea. I'm not sure why that's not, I'm not even sure why it's still in the curriculum. They still want to teach it to you. It's an alternative way to do it, but you should always opt for that caldwell is the superior view. For the position, of course, erect being the better of the two options, erect or prone. By the way, very uncomfortable to be face down on the table like that. Don't do that to your patient. They don't stand. That's just dumb if you ask me, unless they're just unable to stand. Forehead and nose resting on the table or the upright bucky. Now, I'm not sure if they taught you this in lab, but if you're having a lot of trouble getting that line, which is the OML perpendicular, simply just make sure that the patient's forehead and nose are in contact with the IR. If you are doing so, the OML should be in a perfect perpendicular line. So that's different from the sciences, as you probably have learned, the sciences you put the tip of the nose, but for the PA axial Caldwell skull, forehead and nose touching the IR. Did you learn that in lab? Mm -hmm. Yes? Good. So when we do that, the OML will be what's perpendicular to the IR. OML is very easy to find. You look at the pupil of the eye. Make sure they're looking straight ahead, not the sides, or it's going to throw you off. Hold your pin up, line it up with the patient's pupil, make sure it's lined up with the EAM to have that nice, straight, perpendicular line shape. That is very important because if that is not perpendicular or if we use the wrong line, which the one we use often that's incorrect is the IOML, which is slightly lower, that's gonna throw off where those petrous ridges are projected through the orbital area. And we must have those petrous ridges shown up in the orbits, otherwise that is an incorrect position. Where's the IR in central way to go? It's gonna be going through the nasion. The nasion, where's the nasion, by the way? Nasion. Top of your nose, Good correct. Job, the, the nasion, the nasion. Just it on you. Oh, we'll go over the angles here in a second. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry, should I get oh. who's, who's um, first? That first picture with the with them like that, can, can you do them, do that standing? Or you don't have to. You can, it's, it's better to do it standing. Just, no, I'm talking about with the hands. You see how you got Oh, with the hands? Can, can they to. place it? Or I just wrap their arms around the IR personally and stabilize. Okay. That's how I've always had patients do it. Okay. And you will notice we have two, the, both positions demonstrated here, guys. You'll notice there's no angle on this one. There is an angle on this one. That's the main one right there, that axial called well. But we have this alternative that we're going to talk about as well. Yes? So let's say hypothetically we have a patient who either refused or is unable to do the called well PA. How would you shoot an AP? So you can do it the exact same way with their back against the IR. You just have to look at that OML, make sure it's perpendicular, but you're going to reverse your angle. So it's going to be? It's going to be a 15 degree cephalic angle. Anytime you flip a patient when it comes to angulations, that angle flips as well. It inverses. How would that project the... It'll, it will, to answer your question, it'll work, but it's going to magnify the anatomy. It would magnify the... Uh, mm -hmm. It's not going to be as nice. Yeah. All right, CR for the PA. This is the regular PA, by the way. That's gonna be perpendicular exonasion. But the one that I have bolded in red, that's the main one, 
PA axial called well, we're going to use a 15 degree called at angle and we're also going to exit that nasion. 10 by 12 cassette lengthwise. And by the way, different from the lateral, we do want lengthwise on the PA because the head becomes longer in the AP and PA position versus wider on the lateral. And we're going to collimate down accordingly. Once again, <coughs> collimate horizontally until you get close to the cheeks. Vertically, you want to collimate down until you're grazing that vertex once again. That's the main point on that collimation. As you see, a right vertex and on, and on both sides. So exit and exit on both. Call to well utilize that 50 degree call to angle. And if you have trouble with that, lining up that bucky like I used to in x-ray school, oh, that was my Achilles heel. I always say, before you get your patient up there, put that angle on your tube first, line it up to your bucky, and then make the adjustments moving forward. That's how I like to do it because that was my big, whew, boy, I messed that up a lot going to school. I always misalign the tube and the bucky. That was my big mistake. You can, you almost be experts because no one, no one's saying that's me too. No, no, you just pray that we don't get. Just pray that you won't get that one. Just give me a lateral. My teachers get so mad at me because I always misalign the tube to the bucky. I was so nervous, that's the only thing I always forgot to do. That's a performance anxiety in extra school, let me tell you. My teacher, she was so mean. You must have been a Harry Bell kid. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what crazy school she was. She worked at She's from Louisiana, so. Let's... If we did too, could you go Absolutely, it's like riding a bike. I've done, I've done x-rays, like I went to, I, every once in a while I jump in the room and do some. I did a pediatric not too long ago. I was talking to Georgette and she was saying that uh, last weekend, or this past weekend, Easter weekend, mm -hmm. there were like some really understudies and that uh, Andre and Andre Wesley kind of jumped in. It really is like riding a bike, like it comes right back to you. Just it's skills that you never forget. It becomes muscle memory. Well, she said it was like, Annoying because you had to kind of teach him the new equipment. Oh, still <laughs> the old equipment. That that would probably be the biggest challenge: yeah. learning the newer equipment if you're not used to using it. But as far as the positioning and all that goes, it's it just comes right back to you. She's like, he was pulling this way, but he had the buttons for this way. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So what's our stars of the show, guys? For our PA, let's see, it's gonna be separate. Yeah, PA first. If you're opting for this very inefficient method, which you should not be doing. Yeah. These are what we're going to be looking at. Orbits to be completely filled by petrous ridges. Do make note on that. Regular PA without the angle will have the orbits completely filled by the petrous ridge. Y'all see that? See what I'm talking about? Petrous ridges take up the entirety of the orbits. That's what we're visualizing. Posterior ethmoid air cells that criss the galley, of course, as well. Frontal and front, frontal bone and the sinuses. And dorsum celli, seen as curved lines, seen between the orbits just above the ethmoid air cells, but that is so minuscule, you really can't see that. They had to draw a line on it to show you. This is the inefficient x-ray right here. You don't want to do this one. You want to do that called well, but it does exist as an alternative. Do you have an image without the dotted line? So we can try to find one. Because no one does it this way. So once again, you see with the collimation, they probably could collimate horizontally a little bit more to get closer to the cheeks or the zygoma. Raising the top of the vertex as we should be. But ideally, we want to call up as much of that face as possible because we're only interested in the area of the nose up. That's our main area of focus. That's one thing that's challenging too about teaching head work. It's become so obsolete that you can barely find any newer pictures of it anymore. Almost everything's like older pictures because no one does head work anymore. They all just go to CT. It's super rare. So where are the frontal sinuses in that image? They are very difficult to locate. So remember when we were talking about frontal sinuses and development? Remember we said that some people just don't develop them at all? Mm -hmm. This would probably be a case of someone who does not even have frontal sinuses because you can't even make them out. Unless they're just super light and you can't, you can't see them. But it looks like it's sort of as you can have frontal sinuses if you ask me. You see maxillary and ethmoid. Yes. Are all 
No, so this would be a lengthwise one. Okay. So think about the shape of the head. Lateral it becomes long, so crosswise, or wide rather. Yeah. PA and APs, the head's longer, so we want to do lengthwise. Now here's the one we do want to do. That's why I put a big star on that, guys. That's the one you want to know inside and out. And master, that being the PA axial caldwell. And what is the most distinct portion of the PA axial caldwell? The peaches rib, rib, the big, 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 the the big, 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 the we also are going to see the anterior ethmoidal air cells and many of the same structures as the PA, that being like the crystalgali, or the realms, frontal sinuses, the frontal bone, but you can see the frontal sinuses here much more clearly compared to that last image. But did you not tell the seniors about the W? The what? No, there's, in the waters, there's the three W's. That's a good thing to tell them, though. That was new. That was a new thing with you guys. Who's the Merrill's thing? Merrill's thing. That was neat. Yeah, I like that too. Peaches roots are deep in the water. For water's view. Okay. <laughs> We're not able to visualize the dorsum sally, right? You cannot. Is that because it would be superimposed like, underneath the occipital? Yeah, it's like all right here. Okay. It's all superimposed on itself. Ugh. Wow, it's almost 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. you, you get to talking, you forget how long you've been talking. I got to practice for this speech next week because it won't be going on for two hours. It's only got 50 minutes. <laughs> they don't be like, good, they're, they're gonna be getting that cane and pulling me off the stage. Like, someone mm -hmm. shut that man up, get him off the stage. Yeah, I'm to start <laughs> Four right hours later. <laughs> 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 Told you that I'm to start Let's wrap up this called well and then we'll call it a day, guys. Evaluation criteria, of course, our proper collimation with the side marker. We want the entire cranium without rotation and tilt. You'll find it's gonna be indicative of every evaluation criteria. We always want the rotation or tilt to make sure it's a true PA, true AP, true lateral, etc. How do we tell that there's no rotation or tilt in this one? We want equal distances from the lateral bores of the skull to the lateral bores of the orbits. Symmetric petrous ridges, so you want them to have that nice, distinct line going across. You don't want, in other words, you don't want a ridge up here and one down here. They need to be in the same plane. We want the LSP of the cranium aligned along the long the columnar field. And then once again, I put it in bold because I mean, registry question, guys. You're going to get that. The A axial distinctly demonstrates the Petrus pyramids in the lower third of the orbits, while the regular PA demonstrates it in the entirety of the orbit. Yes, question? So um, if you can provide evidence of no rotation, but one petrous ridge is like higher or bigger than the other, you can just equate that to like patient's anatomy? I mean, unless there's some kind of severe deformity going on, I can't see a scenario where that would happen, unless you're tilted or I'm, I'm looking at one where one's like a little kind of bump that's higher than the other. I'd have to see that. I'd have to see that. All right, last but not least, guys, evaluation criteria. Once again, regular PA shows the orbits filled. This is talking about the PA, by the way. I'm sorry, let me let me distinguish. This is for Caldwell. This is for the regular PA now, right here. PA is gonna show the orbits completely filled by the Petrus ridges. Entire cranial perimeter showing the three distinct tables of squamous bone and the bony detail of the frontal bone and the soft tissue. You can end on that beautiful gif there, that guy smiling at you. So, I was thinking about that statement. I'm not sure exactly what that's referring to.